basically, I'll pinpoint it. <laughs> Put the needle on the scale. That's who's right at the town next. Back to the drawing board. Adjust to the track. Put the needle on the scale. That's who's right at the town next. Back to the drawing board. Hello, everybody. This is Travis here at Sketch to Animate. Put the needle on the sketch. Yes, you are here live with me this Wednesday evening. It is April. Can you believe it's April already? I'm having a hard time figuring that out. April, the third month, fourth month, January, February, March, April. Yeah, we're in the fourth month of 2024 already. Holy smokes. Well, I hope you guys are doing good because we have an exciting night tonight because we are going to be talking about another favorite animal of mine. Well, I mean, let's be honest. Every single animal is my favorite. So, um, but uh, we're going to be talking about the infamous warthog. Yes, we've probably known the warthog from our our growing up phase of life when uh, I was working as a young buck on the movie called The Lion King, uh, where our good friend Tony Bancroft created and animated Pumbaa. And so now uh, we get to talk about this warthog now and how to draw a warthog today. Now, for starters, I will have to tell you that we will not be having Wink this evening. Obviously, I'm flying solo tonight which is fine, but we will sorely miss him. Uh, maybe because he just like, you're not talking about platypus. Well, I don't want to be a part of this. No, that's not the case. Wink is heavily working behind the scenes with us today. So I will be doing this solo, but just know that he is working diligently with our studio sketch to animate. And we are excited to be a part of this evening. And wow, I am already getting new people, it looks like. I see an Alice Reed is in the house saying, hello, Travis. Hey, I have not seen you in here. And of course, I see your pal, Drewby. Uh, Drewby, 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 no, Drew B. Um, you just got a class? That's great. With Tony, Tony, you mean Tony Bancroft, the Tony Bancroft? That's awesome. Um, so questions, guys, who all is in the house tonight? Cause, um, I, since I'm flying solo, I am using restreams chat, uh, to look at both Twitter and also or sorry, Twitch and YouTube. So if you guys are in the house tonight, please give me a shout out. Uh, we did our best today to kind of promote this, but, um, I think Facebook wasn't working correctly, but we were able to get some promotions out today about, the infamous warthog and how to draw them. So I'm just going to dive right into it. I'm just excited about doing this because I want to, I want to get to talking about little facts and, and things about the warthog that I found that were interesting and then go into actually drawing actual drawing today. I want to, I want to dive in cause I'm really excited about like working with this, this character today. Um, see where we can go with him being cartoonier and kind of, find some story behind him and maybe create a new character out of this. And ultimately what I'm going to do with this war hog is I want to create a character that we can apply to our show arc. So without further ado, I'm going to switch it. Where do I switch? I'm going to switch it to solo Trav. Here we go. Boom. So there you have it. How's everyone doing? By the way, Alice, you doing good? Your pal Drewby, you doing good? Is there anybody out there besides the two of you? Because I don't see anyone else responding or saying hello. Um, I will probably tell Wink to throw out a shout out to everyone to make sure that we get some more people in the house tonight. Um, but if you're out there, I'm going to give you just like two minutes to give me a shout out to say hello. Um, in the meantime, I am going to uh, get some of wink to uh, make sure he makes a shout out 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 to all our peeps to watch this show boom 
All right. Oh, we got Joe FMD. Awesome. I am here. Crit still says, hey, sorry, got here late. Not a problem. We'll, we'll, we'll take our time. But today I'm excited because we get to talk about the Warhog. Um, one, one of the things that I learned about, and I, and I always learn something, no matter how much I know about a particular animal, I'm always learning. And that's the beauty about being an artist and an animator and a creative that you never stop learning. I think the moment you stop learning is the moment you just stop your career. Um, honestly, every day is a new experience, a new learning experience, and I freaking love it. So um, with the Warhog, um, you know, I forgot how, first off, how amazing their features are, how rugged and distinct they really are compared to boars and compared to other uh, animals that are out there like pigs or domesticated pigs. They have a very distinct look and feel to them that uh, make them all their own type of species. So, anywho, I am going to hop right into it if you guys don't mind now because I think a two couple of minutes have gone by and I just want to dive into what we have on this plate today and that is the Warhog. Now, what I do with everything here is I always say, why are we here today? Well, we're here to have fun while learning how to draw. So if you guys are in front of your computers, which I hope you are, and you have a pencil or paper or, or something digital, like a digital display or an iPad, get those out and start sketching along with me because I think we're about to have some fun. And also it's about starting to understand what we are drawing and leading up to actual art. Um, everything I do is story driven. As I always say, I try to find the story in every experience that I have. Um, and I always try to apply it fundamentally to, uh, my own stories that I want to tell through animation. I am a storyteller and animation is my vehicle in which to tell that story. And so that is why I'm here to spread the good word of animation and storytelling. So the steps that we always take if you're the first time coming here, the first thing that we always do is we talk about facts. Facts meaning we do research and we learn all that we can about that particular animal. Hello, Mach, uh, it says Mach, Mach Warriors. Hello, D. Good to see you here tonight. Um, and then we go into anatomy. We start talking about the bone structures and muscle structure and its movement. And then, of course, we go into sketching and defining its shapes and movement and expressions. Now, I didn't do a whole lot of detail on the actual uh, skeletal structure tonight, I thought we would kind of like pull up some uh, images that I've already pulled up on Google and kind of talk about those a little bit and about their bone structure. But um, mainly I wanna talk about their shape, language, and relationships uh, this evening because we got a lot to cover. And then, um, then the last but not least, which we didn't have in this part here is after the exploration, I really want to, it's kind of a combination. You kind of, as you evolve an understanding and research and start sketching a story, hopefully will start to emerge out of the research, out of your own research that you've created from doing this particular style. Now, everything that I do, and this is why we do these slides the way we have and we repeat the same thing at the very beginning because if there's somebody who's never watched this, they can kind of understand. This is conceptually how I always began everything. Even if I'm on a project, let's say Super Pets, um, I'll research the animals that they're giving me tasks to do. I won't just draw an animal for the sake of drawing it. I'll actually draw a pig and learn about the pig or about a tortoise. I'll read up on them. I'll just it's just for my own education, uh, and it helps in some way my brain wrap around how I will be designing and moving and structuring and, and animating these characters. So now with why the Warhog? Well, simply put, animals are awesome, and so is a Warhog. I, again, with the 8.4 million different species of animals that are out there, um, which of course include insects, include jellyfish, include anything that's out there that is considered living outside of flora, or is it flora? Yeah, outside of flora, then we would consider them an animal species, including ourselves. So warhogs, 
Well, to me, they're very interesting, not just because we worked with them during uh, the the show itself, like Lion King, um, but yes, um, I've always had a fascination for like uh, savannah animals, whether it be a zebra, whether it be a hyena, whether it be um, the wolves or uh, vultures or any animals from uh, Africa. But also, I mean, I love everything about what all of these animals do and how they interact and how they are part of this big ecosystem of this planet we call Earth. Uh, Mock just said, have you worked with Aaron Blaze? Aaron is actually spelled with B-L-A-I-S-E. And if you figured it out, he's probably related to me. I will give you that. Um, anyways, yes, I have worked with him before. I was actually, for those of you that don't know me, um, I have been working in animation for about 33 years. I've worked on every movie from Beauty and the Beast uh, all the way up to uh, Lion, I mean, uh, Brother Bear and Lilo and Stitch. I helped animate Stitch. I was one of the animators on that. Uh, and then going into story and storyboarding and character development into TV and film further on. And I've kept my career going for the last 34 years. And now uh, we've embarked on a new journey, which is creating our own studio called Sketch to Animate Studios, which is partly education and partly creating original IPs with video games and animated short series. So there you go. Now back to it. Okay. Warhogs are such interesting creatures. They look like a pig decided to join a heavy metal band and rock out on stage with wild hair and a tough attitude. That, to me, would be a pretty good explanation of what a warhog is. They are structurally built to last. They are built for speed. They're also built for longevity, longevity and also to live under harsh conditions such as savannas and desert-like areas of Africa. Warhogs are so much more than tusks and tufts. They are resilient creatures that love to root in dirt, wallow in mud, and reside in abandoned burrows. All very true, which is why I love these guys so much. The Latin name for this, and boy, I hope I can get this right. It is Facochioris africanus, or Ethiopicus. Ethiopicus. Yes, I think that's correct. There are two species, a common warthog and a desert warthog. Although there used to be two subspecies of the desert warthog, but around, they say, according to my research, around the 1870s, uh, that particular subspecies went extinct. So now for the, war, the desert warthog, the other remaining subspecies would be called a Somali a Somali, a Somali, Somali uh, warthog. Males and boars, males are boars and females are sows. Just like uh, a sow is a female pig and a domesticated pig, same way, same thing. And we have wild boars in uh, all through uh, North America. They were actually introduced from uh, the European, uh, uh, the Europe or Europe area. Uh, way long time ago, they were introduced into North America area, which where we have uh, boars and wild pigs. But in Africa, we literally only have these two types of species that live predominantly or only in the habitat region of Sudan and southwestern Ethiopia. So when I was researching this, I didn't realize this uh, with their homes, but I didn't realize they actually don't like to kind of dig for their own burrows. Instead, they like to take or take up space, squat, if you will, um, other homes from or abandoned homes. I don't think they take a home away. They typically will look for an aardvark burrow that were that a aardvark had either dug a hole in or they will find a natural burrow that they will kind of go in and nest and uh, raise their young in, especially the females, um, which is interesting. Uh, 
They say with a burrow, they enter backwards, and that's probably as a defense mechanism, which is um, because, of course, being in the savannas, um, you have many, many predators. And so you have to be built for many things, and one of which is survival uh, with lions and hyenas and any other predatorial animals that might be out there lurking in the savanna waiting for their next meal and these guys are on that list so when they are young they have to be protected because they're very much reliant on their mothers um they like open lightly forests and grassy areas probably in my assumption um they like this because they like to be on the alert you know they they need to be um they can they can hide in uh these grassy plain areas but they also like being around certain areas where they can see the landscape from a distance. Uh, gregarious. They have a fancy way to say they like to be with other war hogs. Um, they are, they're, they're, they're actually males. War hogs are actually more, um, and this goes for females too. Um, they're solitary. Um, they have a, uh, soundings, groups of female pigs that when they are about to give birth, um, they tend to group up together, uh, probably due to, to kind of protection in numbers. Uh, males tend to be more solitary, but only come in during mating season. There is a mating season, which is why you have these seasonal, uh, uh, soundings that happen with warhogs. Uh, warhogs, uh, tend to be, um, the, the males tend to be solitary, but will, um, again, like I said, when they're interact during the mating season, they also become very uh, feral and will fight uh, and for their mating partners. They tend to be poly, so um, probably out of sheer necessity for survival, they will mate with several other male species of warhog so that they can continue the population of the warhogs. Um, survival, they are omnivores, which they can survive without water during the dry season. This is what I thought was pretty amazing about them when I didn't really know, um, was that warthogs can pretty much survive up to three to four months without drinking any water whatsoever. So, and when you think about where they they live and where the region is, um, it makes perfect sense because they can go with bouts of dry season for up to three to four months, maybe even longer. But these guys can outlast those dry seasons until water emerges and rainy season occurs, which is pretty awesome. How they do that, I still want to research and do more on like the, the biological side of how they can survive uh, with very little water like this. But clearly they have adaptations and things that allow them to be able to do this, which makes them pretty awesome, pretty rugged, and pretty amazing. Um, they are supporters, um, meaning they, they benefit from creatures eating off of ticks off their, uh, uh, supporters, meaning benefits from creatures eating ticks off its back. Um, they actually implore it. They, they love it. They love it when other animals, like uh, I read the velvet monkey to the banded, um, mongoose and all the way up to the ox peckers, uh, uh, birds that you would usually see in the savannas that sit on top of oxen and, uh, and wild uh, water buffalo that eat uh, off their, their noses and ears. Well, they do the same thing with warhogs. And so warhogs, like that other animal species, will come in and groom and pick the ticks, pick the insects, all of those pesky things that we don't want on ourselves. They will let them come in and kind of eat off of them, which is kind of cool because it helps – it's another part of an ecosystem when you think about it that makes it really interesting that not only are they um, survivalists, but they also are part of an, an ecosystem that allow other animals to survive simply because they have ticks and insects on them. And that allows those animals to feed off of them, which is pretty interesting. I think, um, before I go any further, the, the other things that I learned about, war hogs that I thought was pretty good is that they, they, um, will adopt other piglets. Um, when, um, let's say a mother is killed, um, and there's an offspring, uh, part of the sounding another, uh, aardvark, I'm sorry, aardvark, another war hog will come in, female war hog will come in and, 
and take care of that and and adopt and bring that into their into their clan. Um, really interesting known facts is males tend to be with their mothers. Uh, I guess they're uh, in a sense of mother, mama's boy. Uh, they will be with their mothers up to two years, and uh, and rely on them for up that before they go off on their own and become fully mature. Whereas the females. Uh, will stay with the, 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 their mother until they become of maturity of, for mating, and then they go off on their own. And when it becomes time to that mating season, then they'll, the males and females will come together, and then when they are pregnant and give birth, they will find their groups of soundings to um, make sure that they give birth and they are protected in this small group of, of warhawks. All of this is just, to me, really fascinating because when I read and I research... It's really reliant on the food source, the region in which they are, live, and how animals adapt and survive to particular regions. Um, and in this case, these guys are just tough. Um, other things that they probably didn't know, I'll go into the weight and height and average and all this right now, and then I'll hop back into some little facts that I found that were interesting about the warhog itself. Um, in height, they can get up to about 2.5 or 76 centimeters or uh, that's pretty, pretty, that's a pretty average size. I'd say two and a half. That's, they're pretty big. And then their length is up to 4.9 feet or 149.352 centimeters. Now that can vary in range. They can be bigger or smaller. Um, they've, they've seen some males reaching up to, to uh, weights. Uh, where, where they have here on an average of 110 to 250, but males can be bigger. They can go up to 300 pounds or 120 to 130 kilos or maybe even 140 kilos. No, 120, 130 kilos. Um, their hair is sparse. So if you've looked at a lot of research of our, uh, war hogs like I have, uh, you'll notice that they have sparse hair all over their bodies and then they have that kind of mangy not mangy but i mean they have this really coarse hair that kind of acts as their their mane that goes from the top back top of their head kind of like me and they go all the way back down to its tail and then their tail has a little bit of raspy kind of uh uh harsh uh tufts of hair on the back now their legs are sturdy and have three functional toes on each foot and then their head is wide and flat-faced with a prolonged snout and four tusks. Now those tusks that you see that are coming up are actually their bottom tusks. Their bottom tusks are actually longer and their top tusks are shorter that come down. If I got that correctly, I believe. Yeah, the tusks are short on the bottom and then the ones are longer on the top. That's right, they curl up like this and then they have these other ones that kind of come in like this. And they mainly use that for digging and during uh, mating season when they're fighting other war hogs or fighting off um, predators. Uh, their, their eyes sit high on their heads so that they can spot predators while gazing. And that's common with many type of animals like themselves that sit in the savanna and they have lions going after them. You know, lions have their, he their eyes in the front where a lot of these other uh, omnivores or herbivores tend to have them sort of to the front, to the side, so that they can see from both both angles this way. Um, and that's, I think, Shira, that's out of function and design for survival and many other ad adaptations that happen when they live in a savanna like this. Um, and I just find that really interesting. Uh, when you look at predatory animals that tend to have their heads and their eyes set in the front versus these other animals that have their eyes to the side. And the warts that where they get the name warthog, this is the part that I thought was also interesting, is that a warthog's warts aren't actually warts. They're like bone and cartilage, and they come out on the sides of their cheeks, and they come out down uh, near their snout area as well. And a lot of this has to do with why their, their, their structure are so like prominent in their skull design and, and where the bone and cartilage is. And this is built out of... Um, again, defense, fighting, and um, to, and protection. Really, I mean, protection against other warhogs that might want to fight them, or against other predatorial animals that come after them. 
Let's see what else we got. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of, oh, the knee pads. This is something that I didn't realize is that when warthogs start to graze, they have knee pads on their front forelegs, on their, on the forelegs in the front, and they kneel and they kneel when they drink, they kneel when they graze. And so they have these very predominant knee pads that allow them to do this, which I found very interesting. I didn't realize that was, again, based on design and based on functionality for what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. But they have, and I don't know if you necessarily call it a knee, but that's what they have on the front where they're, where they're when they sit, they will bend down and they, they will sit like this and then they will drink and eat their and graze however they do with that, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so with all of that being said, I didn't go into great detail yet, but I want to research a little bit more with the Warhog. I wanted to kind of get more technical because I just love the shape language that they have, but in reading them, finding that they were durable, finding that they're survivalists, um, and they and can live under harsh conditions and still survive through uh, dry seasons and savannas and predators like lions and other uh, predatory animals like themselves. Um, they were worthy of our attention, my attention. And really, um, they are fun to draw. When I started drawing this initial one that I have in our slides, I was like, man, their shapes are really, really cool. And just like I talked about before in their shape language, um, you can define and break any kind of like four-legged, even bipedal animals into five sections. Uh, and those five sections is what you can see here in this particular slide is the head, the neck, the shoulders, the mid torso, and the back area. Any animal can be broken uh, into this, any kind of like mammal style animal can be broken into these shapes, which I found once I had that idea in my head, I realized I could start to kind of find similarities in design of all mammal kind of creatures, uh, whether they're bipedal or, uh, qu quadrupeds. Um, I found similarities in comparative anatomy that allowed me to think of the shape language and start designing and start creating these animals a lot faster. And uh, once I broke it down to, into these like simple terms, uh, which I found really interesting. But so, le so without all of that talk, let's go into let's get drawing. And so I want to get through these uh, slide, the slide presentation just so I can, I'm antsy to kind of like sketch a little bit today. So when creating characters based on these interesting facts, consider the world this character will be in and who they will interact with. This is where we start talking about story. Um, what have we learned about these animals, in this case, the warthog, and what can we utilize from that research that we can build a backstory, we can build a character, we can build something around their personality that can make our own characters of a warthog interesting. The more you know about a character, the more life you can breathe into them and creating a believable story that others can enjoy. And that's the whole, uh, fundamentally, that's what inspires me daily and drives me daily to draw, uh, as particularly animals. Um, I, it's the fact that I can build story around them, that I can, I can find something new and interesting. And then I can then take that in, in information and build my own character and, and, and Frankenstein, my, my character to life in, in animation and storytelling, which I, I love doing just plain and simple. So for me, what I like you guys to do, like I've said with everyone is that practice what we did tonight, practice about what we talked about and make it your own. And then what we always like to do with everyone here is like, if you like what we did tonight and you want to draw a warthog and you want to research further and share it, that information with us, then we want you to practice it, make it your own, share it and post it online and tag us at sketch to animate, which helps us by helping you. It helps us because then we can spread the good word about what we're doing because we do all this for free. Why? Because we feel it's necessary to give back our experience, our knowledge 
in what we've done for the last 33, 34 plus years. Um, and without further ado, I say we get into actually drawing a Warhog. So actually, before I even do that, does anyone out there have any more questions? I know it's been silent since I've been talking all this time, but do you have any questions? I, I see Crystal said earlier on, I can really see you really enjoy searching about them. Yes, um, I did. It's and, and I do that with everyone. But for whatever reason, I think what I liked about the warthog itself is, is the shape, how large their head is to their neck and their body. And when I looked at their their anatomy, like their skeletal structure, their vertebrae really uh, is built for the muscles that you see in their neck and chest. It, they're so heavy, front heavy because of the head. When you look at it, and we'll show that now, I'm going to actually, let's see, I'm going to hide this and we'll pull up Photoshop. And there we go. We can, uh, I'll put this, I'm going to do the skeletal here. You, you notice on the skeletal structure, how big their their back muscle and their shoulder vertebrae are for it to hold all of the the muscles around the scapula and the, and the neck and, and shoulder area which is really 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 cool um i'm gonna go into back into the groups again and i'll just sketch and hide layers as we go um uh, but i broke this up this particular just warhog i just drew one warhog to kind of define the process in which I like to do things. And essentially it's like this. First, I like to do gestures. Then the gestures meaning I like to kind of just explore the shapes. And over to the right where you, can see, you can't see off screen here, um, I do have, um, and I'm gonna pull it over, boop. I have, see, I do, I do little Google research and I just start looking at their shapes. I start looking at their movement. I start watching videos. And I usually like to start here, which is, I'll point to it right here. I usually like to start in this area, which is just simple exploration, figuring out shapes, figuring out the language of what they are. And I'm not worried about the three-dimensionality of that character. I just want to sit and explore it. And so, you know, I'll do just that. I'll, I'll start finding shapes. So like, you know, the front of the head is pretty much defined like this. And then the neck, um, like this and then the body like this and let's say if the, the guy was sitting down on the ground you know he might look like this and I'll, and I'll just start exploring I'll start finding shapes about this character that I found interesting and really I'm looking at this and go okay what does this graphic shape look like what does this graphic shape look like and I start looking at this particular animal from different angles um, because there's lots of reference points meaning there's a lot of rigid areas especially in his head their head and skull area and they're and they they have a, a nice rigidness to them with some soft areas like the mid torso it's really easy to kind of build shapes around that which i found really fun and interesting um and then from there like this particular shape that you see right here that i drew i can start just exploring and you know let's say have the head and chest area right here the tusks and start figuring out like what i would want to have this animal like i'm not even looking at I'm, i have the reference up here i'm just looking at my graphic design shapes that i found and i also because i research a lot of the animal before i come online and go live here um i can start um, I've done my warm-ups, right? I've done my, my little warm-ups as, as far as how the how I see the warhog. So I can I can start doing this. Plus, I can start drawing them pretty quickly. Um, but also, what I found interesting is that um, because I talk about the comparative anatomy and how similar shape languages are with other animals, I kind of can break this into the shapes of these quadrupeds and break it down and, and then modify that as I go. Like I, cause I know how a horse is built. I know how a lion is built. I know how uh, water buffaloes and other animals are built. I can sort of make guesstimations in terms of the general shape of it. 
And then from there, I can modify it. I can alter it. I can adjust to it. So if I draw this quick gesture of this animal like I did here, I can then go in and start really homing in by looking at the other references that I have of Warhogs off to the right screen or off to the left screen here. I can start looking at it and go, oh, yeah, I need to build the eye. The eye needs to be around this area. And then the cheek, the predominant cheek needs to be around here. And so I know that's there. And then I go, oh, yeah, they have the top of their head and, they're, and they have a very predominant um, brow that's on their uh, skull. And then I go, okay, they have a triangular kind of shaped ear uh, that I, I have learned to draw and I can start building now these interesting shapes. Now that I also know that the snout is a little wide, uh, in, in the, towards the end and that they have a wide snout at the very end of their nose. Uh, the bridge of their nose right here, it tends to get a little wider and shorter and as it gets closer up to the eyes themselves. And then even in their skulls, they have a very predominant, um, area where their teeth come out and their their molars sit in the back i kind of already know that and the, you know now i also know that the the tusks or the 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 other tusks are kind of curved backwards are down here and they have a very predominant chin so i can just again just based off the reference that i'm looking at and how i'm seeing things um i can start building out this character and I can start designing him and saying, oh, they're, they're gonna, now they're going to sit down. What would that look like sitting down? And I know they have a, a nice belly here and the rib cages in this area and they have their mane and I can start developing and designing a, a fun little mane for them for the back and, uh, and they have their back butt and hip area and their knee comes up here and they have a very predominant like heel um, that sits in the back because of the stru the bone structure. They have this uh, where the back toes are, uh, the hind legs and their toes in the back. They have this very predominant bone that comes out uh, before the the femur and the and the. I'm forgetting my anatomy of bones, the bone names, but this particular bone here connects in, and that creates that nice graphic shape here that we see in their hind leg. And then I can, I know that it'll probably curl in like this and they probably have another, that it'll be like behind over here, the other part of the hind leg, the furthest hind leg, and then having their, their knee pad area. This is, you know, where I, we call the knee pad area. Um, and their other foreleg, the toes in the front, can sit around this area. And then their neck kind of comes in between. And then they have their shoulder and scapula area, which is around here. And based on those shapes, I can start to define this pose. And even though it doesn't exist in my reference, I can start to make up poses and start to use the reference that I have of these Warhogs and start defining this character in the sitting position. And that's kind of how I go about drawing animals after a while. Um, you want to be able to draw them from memory. You want to be able to draw them in different positions. You want to be able to draw them um, for the sake of animation. So as more the more information that you have from an animation standpoint of a particular animal, from seeing it from the back view, seeing it from the top view, seeing it from the bottom view, finding as much reference as you can. And of course, not everyone, not all of us live in Africa or in this region to see them wild, or maybe you might have a zoo that might have them. Sure, great, go to the zoo, go draw them as much as you can. Otherwise, we're relying on videos, we're relying on photographs. And we need as much information, or at least I do, of that animal so that I can see them at all different angles. Um, once I have a clear, basic understanding of the shape language, and once I have designed my own character in a simple shape language format, then I can start putting that character into different positions, different angles, 
different areas and then I can start pushing expression and I can start pushing um, and the animation side of it like what would they look like running what would they look like jumping what would they look like rolling and or in this case what would they look like sitting down and so the only way to kind of really master this idea, and I don't consider myself a master of uh, drawing these animals since I'm still fairly new, but I understand the principles of comparative anatomy with these types of animals, I can start making up and, and, and making more of a believable warthog based on my own experience. Now, I don't claim myself to be an expert on these, but I love to learn how to draw these. And I believe any of us can learn to draw pretty much any animal with enough practice, enough tenacity, uh, and uh, just barreling through a lot of drawing time to create these particular characters. Now, um, you probably lost me on the, the video, just so you guys know. Uh, my camera just went out, um, but it doesn't matter because this is what's most important, is seeing what we have here on my drawing. I'm gonna actually zoom in on this guy a little bit so you can see this a little bit better. But this is how I really kind of dive into it, and it's just practice. Practice makes perfect, um, and that's, what I like to do. Now I'm, I'm looking at, again, um, over into the side, I have my reference, like right this. I can look at this on Google and I can see, okay, what does he look like from the side? What's the side view look like of a warhog? Uh, what is a, uh, a front view look like? And from, this ex from these references that I find, I can start going, oh, his, his cheek is probably somewhere around here. Um, and his other area where they have the other wart, there's like two typically on either side of their face. I can say, okay, great. There's one right here, there's one here. Uh, here's their mouth, here's their, their cheek, their bottom jaw area, and then uh, here is their neck muscle that comes in and their shoulders that come in right around here. And then they have sometimes the, the they have the, this, little bit of skin that kind of hangs down between their chest and I can start coming kind of coming in right here I know the knee pad is there and this breaks up into the shape of their uh, front foreleg and their toe area and so I can start building that out and I have now a very loose sketch or further defined sketch of this particular warhog. And again, I'm looking at, let's say, a side view right now of a warhog to kind of give me a better uh, idea of, based on my gesture, how that shape language would look from this particular angle. Their, their, their shoulders and are in this area and their neck muscles are here. They tend to have a lot of wrinkles uh, in these areas. They're very lean animals in general. Um, they're not fat, or I've never seen a really fat, overweight um, <laughs> warhog. I've seen very lean, beefy, very big uh, male warhogs. Like the one I'm looking at right now is huge. Uh, and, and, and comparing like some of the other females warhogs that I'm looking at in my reference folder right now. Um, and I just keep drawing. I take all that information. And sometimes it's not always correct. Like I'll look at this drawing maybe tomorrow and go, oh, I missed something. Oh, that proportion's wrong. Um, but I don't quit. I don't stop today and say, okay, I'm not gonna draw warhogs anymore. I like to continue that, this research. I think with any animal that we draw, with anything that we draw, um, it takes years of practice to draw anything. And I think we get better as we continue to draw and understand the principles of how comparative anatomy works and how bone structures work. And that gives us, um, I think, a little edge onto how we can quickly adapt to drawing a new type of species of animal. Um, I think that's why I always push for skeletal anatomy and muscle anatomy and understanding those for all of these animals because that is gonna help you not just in the warhog, but I think it's also gonna help you with 
other particular animals. And so there you go. I'm drawing now another warhog just based on that quick gesture that I did. And all of this up here sort of kind of tells you a general idea of my approach from gesture drawing on this gray one to the shape breakup uh, that I see here to understanding their anatomy on their skeletal structure side to their final drawing, uh, whether it be more realistic or more cartoony. Now, the ultimate goal for me for this is to get it to be that it becomes a more cartoonier looking thing or, or animal. Um, because at the end of the day, stylistically, I want to be able to take all of the research that I've learned from drawing this particular warhog, and I want to be able to adapt it to a cartoon style warthog that I would like to have. Um, give me one second here. I'm going to see if I can turn my camera back on. But is all this interesting? I mean, my rambling and talking about my approach as I'm drawing here, do you guys find this interesting? Do you have any questions on my approach to this and my reasonings why I think this is a good approach to drawing not just a warhog but other animals? If you have any other questions, please tell me. I would love to know more. Uh, I feel like Crystal's uh, uh, the only one talking, which I don't mind at all. It's totally, totally fine. Um, I'm just looking at uh, where am I here? Travis, where is your solo Travis without template? Um, I'm just going to look at my camera and see why it's not coming on. Whoops. We'll get rid of that. There you go. Again, I'm, I'm looking at why my camera turned off. Let's see here. I got it back. I think I got it back. Let me see. See if this works. There we go. I am back, back, back again. All right. Cool. So, again, if you guys find this interesting, let me know. Throw it in the chat right now. I see Joe saying, yes, this is really good. Great. I hope you like it. I hope everything's... Uh, awesome because this to me is what it's all about research and development and it's the best part of what I liked doing when I was working on all these other films not just while I was storyboarding but while I was character designing on various films is the research that I that I do and the knowledge that I get from that um, and ultimately like I said before I will ultimately take this to the level of and I'm gonna knock this down a little bit to where I can draw a cartoon version of this character. Now we know like how they drew Lion King was a semi-realistic but yet cartoony style. They weren't on two legs. Pumbaa wasn't walking around and humified or anthropomorphified in the sense that they're walking on two legs and using their hands and fingers as thumbs with opposable thumbs. But they are were somewhere in between, right? And you we see later on the design when they started doing the more realistic version of Lion King uh, with John Favreau and Lion King one, uh, the remake with this more realistic, they took a more obviously realistic approach with the, the exception of their dialogue being more anthropomorphified, anthropomorphified uh, in their dialogue and their speech, but they still kept them pretty much animals in their natural habitat. Um, but in this case, with Ark and drawing, let's say, a warhog, um, I'm just going to make my first attempt here of what I think the shape language could be for the Ark character, and which is I would have them, they, they I, I treat the characters like this. When they're, they go primal, they will tend to be in their natural state. When they are normally walking around and talking with each other, then they tend to be on two feet and using their hands and gesturing like humans. That's kind of the style that I wanted to choose for this. But at the same time, let's say Bo goes feral or goes sees red and he gets angry, he might get on all fours and start running. Um, and that is a distinct style that I wanted to have for Ark in particular. Now, in this case then, since the shape 
of these guys, I wanted, to, I was thinking that I would have a, a smaller waist area and a bigger chest and then allowing the head to kind of be like in this shape and maybe the ears a little smaller. Um, I was kind of considering having the shoulder area right here and the neck chest area like this. And with him, um, almost treating it like an upside down house for the nose. I don't know why I was feeling like that, but I felt like in terms of shape language, that would be interesting. And then make a little slightly bit bigger tusk, more graphic shape, uh, like this. And when they, when they talk, um, I think their mouth was, was it? I want to make sure that I've got this correctly because I want to see what the warhog's mouth looks like open. Uh, just so I can have the correct anatomy uh, for these guys. When like, let's say he wants, I want to have like this guy talking. Uh, maybe I'll have the cheek. I was almost thinking about still because I have this sort of eyes closer together uh, design language that maybe I could still have a little bit of a bridge because they do have a predominant uh, brow on there and cheek that I could bring the cheeks up a little bit higher right here. Maybe bring their eyes in a little bit together and then making this a little bit wider here. And then when they do say, you know, they start talking um, that maybe I can have this sort of vibe going with his mouth open and his chest. Maybe his hand can, his arm can, his forearm could come out like this, like so. And again, this is my first attempt at kind of seeing what this character could look like in the world of arc, uh, and still keeping the leg more hind looking, hind leg looking, and then the longer tail. They don't have curly tails like uh, some of the domestic pigs. They have a longer, wispier tail, similar to other like wildebeests and um, other uh, savanna animals. Why they don't have a curly tail, I have no idea. Well, because they're not a pig, um, probably for starters. So, you know, basic, basic shape right here. First time seeing what it would look like as a cartoon for our show. But then um, I might do this. I might get rid of this guy, knock this back a little bit, and then see if I can find a better shape language. What if their eyes are closer together, even closer together like this? and uh, more of a triangular shape and I have an eyebrow like this and their triangle uh, ears maybe I have a little tuft of a hair on the top and maybe go narrower here and then go wider here bring their nose More like this, and then again, it's all about exploration. It's all about like figuring out what shape language works as a cartoon for this guy. Uh, give him a little bit of a belly. That's what Chris, Crystal says. Yeah, I think maybe a little belly would be fun, right? Let's see here. Um, I will. 
see, give him a little belly. How about a little bit of belly like this? Bigger neck. I think that belly looks kind of funny. I don't know. What do you think? Funny belly? Do you like the idea of the belly? This could be interesting, this kind of shape language. Uh, and, you know, if I drew over this guy, maybe if I gave him a little bit of belly, he'd be more like this. Like so. Which means I, I push his neck back a little bit more. So if he's got more of a, a top uh, bottom belly here to counter up that weight. Yeah, just like that, Crystal. Crystal. Okay, how about like this? Bring his, his ear here. Let's bring his eyes in just a little bit. His teeth, maybe his, his lip, tongue right there, and then like so. And Okay, I think I have something here. This is fun. So this is kind of like my first attempt at drawing what I think this warthog would look like if he was living on the Ark ship. Now again, I want you guys to try to make this your own and start doing the same thing that I'm doing, research draw a lot of the animal draw more realistic Re draw it from different angles look at find your own unique shape language because we what makes our styles different from one another is our our approach our the way we see and the way we design our interpretations of what we see in the wild with these animals we can interpret it interpret it in our own fashion that makes our drawing style uniquely ours and that's the beauty of this that's why you see a, a steven uh um you know steven silvers and um you know a david coleman to um uh you know various of other artists that they all have their unique style because they have their unique approach and they they see the world through their eyes as i see the world through my eyes in my own way that's what gives us our kind of uniqueness. And I think that's why I love seeing other people's art. I love seeing other people's uh, approach because everyone sees the world differently and we can learn from that. We can, le we can learn from the differences of one another to help us grow in ourselves. And, and kind of like as an artist, I think we, 
we, we have the ability to do this and we have the ability to kind of see the world in a different way that I think allows us to be hopefully a little bit more open to differences and seeing differences in not just animal physical anatomy, but, but personality and how, what makes the world go round is the differences and embracing those differences. So in that sense, I think we are lucky as artists to be able to achieve that and have that ability to do that. Uh, Crystal says, says, be ready for punk rock warhog. I hope I manage to draw it tomorrow. Well, awesome. With that being said, I want to see a punk, punk rock warhog. Um, I think that would be awesome. Again, I'm going to keep diving into this character. Hopefully I will find, um, a, a really fun design in this guy and really start to build him out for the arc show. And by next week, I will share with that information with you. And so without further ado, it's already 610. Uh, we went slightly over our hour, but I want to encourage every single one of you guys out there to have fun uh, with researching this Warhog. Um, and when you come back, and if you have something that you've already drawn, uh, share and tag us. Um, put it on the social media, share it with us, tag us a sketch to animate, make sure that, um, you spread the good word about how, uh, we bring to you guys for free, a lot of fun information about how to draw animals. So without further ado, guys, I really, really do hope you enjoyed this. And, uh, again, send me a message. Let me know how you guys like this and how you feel. And if you've enjoyed it, and I will fill the screen by next Wednesday. And of course, by next Wednesday, we will be doing draw overs. So any of you that are here tonight, draw some Warhogs. If you're having trouble struggling with drawing the Warhog and you haven't quite gotten it, or if you just want to share it, send it to me at, and there's a, a, a new uh, place that you can send it to me at, which is... Um, Actually, you know what? Just send it to Sketch to Animate. I'm going to put it in the chat room right here again uh, to animate at gmail.com. See, did I spell that right? Yes, I did. Send it there to me with your questions or information. Also, add a, a story to it. Say, oh, this is my punk rock uh, Warhog that I drew inspired by uh, our live stream this past Wednesday. And next Wednesday, I will do draw overs for you guys for free. And it will be fun, as it always is. I enjoy it. And hopefully we'll have Wink next week with us. But without further ado, I think I'm going to call it a night. Um, I will open it up for like one more question, two more questions. If anyone has one, um, I'll give you a minute. You can tell me now before we go because it looks like it's 612. But this was fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot, actually. And I'm going to enjoy making this potbelly warhog fun. He, he's already starting to kind of give me some ideas as to what I want to do with him. So uh, Crystal says, how does the muscle studies work? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I'm confused on that part. Well, if you look at, and I'll zoom in on this guy here. I'll bring it down. If you look at my shape, my breakup of shapes, um, in their muscular structure, and I think I will need to delete this, not delete it, but hide it, and then knock this back. The more you start studying comparative anatomy with, let's say, quadrupeds, uh, herbivores like antelopes to uh, wildebeest to the warhog, you'll start to see similarities in their muscle structure. Um, showing the bone structure, I kept it simple over here. We can see how predominant, and uh, let me build another layer, how, whoop, I don't want that, how predominant this shoulder area is where the, where the backbone is. That shows me that there's a lot of muscle being going into that because their head is so heavy and so big. They need very large predominant neck muscles to kind of build that. 
And the, I always start with the muscle the, or the skeletal structure first because that's where the muscles are built on. So I always look at it from the inside out uh, rather than what we typically do is we draw from the outside in. The more we understand what's going on inside, the better results we'll have in our designs on the outside. Um, I know based on that scapula here, and if we come over here, that my muscle, my muscle structure of that will be here. And because I understand how muscles kind of go in and out of each other, um, I know that there's an, over, there's, uh, there's an overall shape that happens, let's say, in the, the, the forearm or foreleg. Uh, you have this sort of shape that's going back in perspective, which uh, indicates the shoulder. The scapula is kind of here and has that sort of shape. And then you have the forearm where the knee pad is um, that indicates this shape here. And when I look at it in ge geometric shapes, I can start to gather information on how the flow of the muscles would probably work by the muscles kind of coming in over this because this is going away. Uh, the muscle kind of coming in because the shoulder is here going away from us and kind of coming in like in a, in this sort of triangular shape. If I'm looking at this scapula versus this scapula, there's a shape that happens here where the neck comes in. And then you have all these neck muscles that kind of come in to support this part of the neck. So you're gonna have very strong muscles or trapezes kind of style muscles uh, in the back here because of the weight of this, and because of how thick uh, his and big his head is, you're gonna need stronger muscles. So I look at this and I start building that. Now I'm also looking at other uh, reference that I have for Warhog muscle anatomy. Um, and so I'm going to just type in Warhog muscle anatomy. See what pops up. And I can start to see, here's, here's a good one of someone uh, that did uh, kind of a, if you will, a uh, 3D version of this. Actually, I'll, I'll do this illustration because that looks pretty interesting too. Um, this, you know, I, you start referencing, you start looking up, you see how people are approaching it. I want to encourage you to look at cows, look at domesticated pigs, look at buffaloes, look at antelopes, look at wildebeest, and start to see how their shoulders, um, I think a wildebeest would be a pretty good comparative anatomy in terms of shoulders and neck muscles. Um, look at hyenas and look at what they do and see how the muscles work. Um, but really, like when you go to this one, this somebody did a 3D model of it, uh, you can start to see how they're wrapping it around the bone structure. You can see part of the bone underneath and how they're building this out. It's, it's okay, I think. I think it's pretty okay in terms of how they're designing it. Um, but what this does, and this is the tricky part. This is, the, I think, actually in terms of the muscle, the hard part, is understanding from a two-dimensional standpoint when we're drawing. Oops, I need to, how come, oh, I don't want that. I want, there you go. Um, how do these lines overlap one another? How does, you know, the belly coming in and then the, sh the, the, the rib cage here. And where does that shape come in? Is this an overlapping shape here for the knee? Um, is there an overlapping shape here? Understanding muscle anatomy and understanding how they flow within one another is the tricky part so that you can feel like a, you understanding how the muscles wrap around the, the skeletal structure and B how they, how they, push back in perspective. And remember, we're drawing this with lines. We're, we're making up uh, a character and we want to give it life. We want to give it dimension and understanding thick and thin lines, understanding the flow of the anatomy will help 
better give us the ability to uh, say, okay, this line here and this line here represents the under part of the shoulder and this line here represents the forearm and because the knee pad is right there, I know there's an overlapping action of the line there versus this kind of maybe might overlap here and this is behind this shape. So I'm trying to build out these lines in a way that allow us or allow me to give the illusion of depth and perspective. And again, it's just practice. It's just, I, I don't really know how to explain any other way other than the more you can draw and look at this from a, uh, from a perspective point of view, the better you you will be able to put like more three dimensional life and volume into your design for this character or for any character for that matter. So anyways, I hope that helps answer it a little bit, Crystal. Um, with any hope and with any practice, I am sure you will kind of come up with your own conclusion on how you approach the same idea that I am doing. Again, this isn't the be all end all to approaching a design. It's just fundamentally these are good pointers, I think, to have when you're just starting out or when you're not just starting out and they're just good reminders to, to tell yourself as you're developing a character um, and again this is uh, taking it from a more realistic approach and then whittling it down to where you have more of a graphic design approach like these guys right here and that's the end of my speech on muscle anatomy okay Crystal says, yes, it helped. Thank you for explaining. All right, guys, without further ado, I am going to call it a night. Thank you again. Um, please join us next week. Bring your drawings with you. S email them to me at sketchyanimate at gmail.com and then tag a little note, what you want to know, what you're struggling with, or you just want to share it with a story. Either way, bring it next week. We will be here same time, same place, um, but just a different day. Uh, different, it'll be... What is next Wednesday? What day is next Wednesday? Well, it's Wednesday. What date? What is the date for next Wednesday? That would be the 10th. So we'll see you April 10th, guys, next week. See you here. Without further ado, I'm going to go and eat some food because I actually am very, very hungry. So goodbye, all. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week. Bye. Basically, I'll pinpoint it. <laughs> Put the needle on the scale. That's who's right at a time next. Back to the drawing board.